I can still burn fat and I still am burning fat, but I'm not afraid of carbohydrates. I eat homemade einkorn sourdough bread. I just had some. I eat apples. I eat berries. I surrendered the obsession with the ketogenic lifestyle. Just kind of surrendered all of that need for control, tracking my glucose and ketones and just diving into nutrient dense eating. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube. Go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates. The book comes out in September. All right, everybody, we've got another episode. I still need a name for this this podcast, YouTube, whatever. I mean, it's Coach Bronson's YouTube channel. So welcome to the channel. Welcome to another episode. Today, I have Rebecca Heishman, who we have been kind of back and forth communicating, commenting on people's stuff, kind of in the space doing things, but we've never actually had a chance to sit down and talk. Rebecca, thank you for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I was super excited when you reached out. Yeah. And you do retreats, you do a lot of content, you do a bunch of different things. And we kind of, I didn't know that you were doing all the retreats in Tennessee. Um, we planned to do one last year, which we had to cancel. Um, and I was like, wait a second, it's the same weekend. We're having some of the I same know. people were I asking about doing it. I thought you guys were head on mission. I was like, what are these guys doing? <laughs> I did not even know that you were doing that until then. So we, we, we canceled it just so you could have your thing. We didn't want to compete with you or anything. No, but tell us a little bit so for anybody that hasn't heard of you um you know or knows about what you do you you've been doing this for a while you've been in the health and fitness space for a while the quality of life space tell us a little bit about who you are what you're doing and then we'll get into the how did you get started and what's your story and all that kind of stuff cool Rebecca heishman previously rebecca farmer and i was really messed up for a long time mm -hmm. i struggled with my health and the quality of my life for most of my life, I struggled with food addiction, a lot of digestive issues, severe mood disorders, and then I ran into severe autoimmune disease, chronic Lyme disease, chronic C. diff, SIRS, and I was on Adderall, Ambien, um, and Benzopidines for 13 years. So that just kind mm -hmm. of paints a picture of my life up until May of 2019, where there was a huge surrender of my life to Christ, um, which we can get into or cannot, but that was a huge part of my healing was mindset and surrender and um, giving up my need for control and then learning how to just um, lean into the intuition and critical thinking skills that God already gave me. Um, living out of fear or faith instead of fear. That is a huge mm, part of my story. Yeah. So I have come from a background of a lot of pain, emotional, physical, mental. I was really messed up, even mentally. I had severe mood disorders, and I'm not ashamed to admit that because I'm free, mm -hmm. and I'm here to spread yeah. the message of hope. So I guess in a nutshell, that's what's going on here. That's awesome. So you're really more about just sharing the story that there is a way out for people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because my whole life, a large portion of my life was diagnoses and being told, I mean, even as a child, I was constantly being diagnosed with something called failure to thrive, which is hmm, just I've a never horrible heard that diagnosis. Okay. Wow. It's literally called failure to thrive. It just means your body is not performing the way it's supposed to perform. And that was so disappointing. It's like <laughs> failure to yeah. thrive, osteoporosis in the sixth grade. Oh. And then later on, as things got worse and worse, I was told by multiple doctors that I would not live past 30 years old. I would never have children. But I'm 32 now, and I have a beautiful, perfect, healthy baby boy in the other room That's uh, awesome. who I gave birth to three months ago, and I'm thriving. And so I, a huge passion of mine is to share the message simply that there is hope because mm -hmm. I was hopeless for a long time. Mm -hmm. How do you, the, the biggest thing I just picked up, and we'll get more into all of the different things you were dealing with and what that process was coming out of there. But from what you just said, I think the, the thing that stands out to me that I see a lot of people struggle with is identifying with your diagnosis how did you what was your process of you know your faith is a big piece of that you said the awareness and mindset piece could you talk about that struggle and and what that was like trying to get away from that yeah i mean i will also you know just thinking about that it started in seventh grade when i was diagnosed with 
OCD, anxiety, narcolepsy, depression, ADHD. And those were all like really serious things. And I was Mm -hmm. told that there was no fix, but you can take this medication. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, you know, you're told there's nothing you can do about it. This is just the way your brain is wired, but you can take this medication. And from then on, it became a part of my identity. Like, oh, I have to take speed, legal speed during the day just to function. Mm -hmm. And I was taking NyQuil and Ambien and uh, Benadryl at night just to barely sleep. And that didn't even work for a long time. So that did become a part of my identity. I didn't talk about it. Uh, In seventh grade, I was self-harming. I was burning myself with erasers because I didn't have identity. I was hurting. And I I just, um, I did that as a way to numb myself. I felt Mm -hmm. so different than all my friends who were in sports and uh, excelling academically. And, you know, I was just like this average kid who was not good at sports and had a really bad mental health and couldn't sleep at night and, and bad digestive issues, even though I'm yeah. eating better than all my friends. So right. that became my identity. Um, and I didn't realize it. And then later on, it got more and more serious. So in 2017 is when I got away from the traditional medicine doctors, got off of my medications because I decided I'm going to get to the bottom of this and um, started using, you know, food as medicine, but mm-hmm. I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. And uh, when you go to those Lyme literate doctors, they act like it's the worst diagnosis. It's the worst thing anyone could ever have. It's Lyme disease mm-hmm. is the worst thing that could happen to anyone. And I'm not trying to downplay it because it is severe, but it quickly becomes an identity. I've noticed in that space, that was the first mm-hmm. like red flag to me. And they were like, you've got to be hooked up to these IVs. You've got to spend thousands of dollars in supplements, do these treatments basically for the rest of your life. And good luck because you'll never truly be able to reverse Lyme disease. Yeah. And that was the first time I was like, these people are literally wasting their lives. So I just said, no, see ya. Like, even if this kills me, I'm not going to live my life identifying with this Lyme disease and throwing money that I don't even have at it. So that was like the first light bulb moment where it's like, I could see that people were in a trap and it was a major trap and I just ran. Yeah. How did you, uh, the fear of losing your identity, does that something that you dealt with in, in making that transition? Because I know for me, my, my, the, the most, the most, um, impactful experience for me from an identity change perspective was right before COVID when I was selling my gym and, you know, I owned a CrossFit gym. I know you've gotten into CrossFit. Uh, we can maybe talk about that a little bit. Are you still doing that? Yeah. On my own Okay, for now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I owned a gym, I sold it that I had spent so much time and energy and built my identity around owning that gym. I was lost for eight months, almost a year when, yeah. when I sold it. I didn't know who I was. Wow. And it was a huge fear and just a bl- I probably sold the gym six months later than I should have because I it was such a, I, I don't know who I am without this. How, how did you approach that in that realizing, hey, I don't want to identify with my illness. I don't want to want to identify with these things that I'm being told are who I am, but I also don't know what it's like on the other side. Yeah, it was, um, that's a really good question because there were, I guess it was like a three or four year gap where it was like, I can't live that life of Adderall and Ambien because I'm a zombie and it's not working. But I also Mm -hmm. can't live this life of the reality that I'm in, which is chronic Lyme disease, because I don't want to Mm -hmm. identify with that. And so I was kind of floating for a long time and I was very numb. And I've said this in multiple interviews where there was at least two years where I did not laugh for a single day. And I don't know if you experienced this in your transition, Mm -hmm. but like... Mm -hmm. I was emotionally numb. I mm-hmm. never thought I would laugh again. I did not feel lighthearted. I did not feel joy. Now, keep in mind, I'm also struggling with severe autoimmune disease and chronic Lyme disease. But a lot of it had to do with the emotional aspect of, I don't know who I am. Um, this was also fresh out of uh, breaking off an engagement. I was in love, working full-time in real estate, you know, dealing with my symptoms with the medications. And when I got off of those, I was having severe panic attacks. And that's when I really felt like I lost my identity because it's like Mm -hmm. the engagement broke off. I had to move back in with my parents because I couldn't handle the panic attacks on my own. And now all my friends are getting married and going to college and having babies. And I am like bed bound. 
And yeah. so I definitely struggled with losing my identity there. And then there was another identity shift from the point that I surrendered the obsession, <laughs> excuse me, with the ketogenic lifestyle and just kind of surrendered all of that need for control, tracking my glucose and ketones and just diving into nutrient dense eating <clears throat> and what I felt like God was leading me to do. That was another surrender of my identity because it was like, okay, I'm not going to identify with uh, medications, but I'm going to identify with this new way of eating that can mitigate my symptoms and that'll be who I am. But then God was like, no, this is, <laughs> but there's a problem here. You're doing the same thing with something else. It's another idol. Yes. Yes. And so Ooh, I had to surrender great, that. Like, it's a whole, I, whole thing with identity and idols. Now I like that comparison and you segue into a great topic of, um, it doesn't matter what you're identifying with if it's not serving you then you need to be aware of that and be willing to change. Right. Did, what was it in, in realizing that, you know, you had switched idols, you had switched what you were identifying with from here's what I'm being told in the medical side of things that my life is going to be determined by to I'm making the choice and that can be yeah. some of the trap. Now I'm choosing to identify with something instead of I'm being forced to identify with something, but choosing to identify with something still has a, a lot of the same limitations. Yeah. Right. How did that, you know, how did that process, how did you go through that process to realize, Hey, wait a second. Yes. The ketogenic diet is a way to go. And I'm probably better off doing this than what I may have been doing before, but it's still not getting me to where I want to be. Yeah. And being able to break away from that. Yeah. Well, it's all just a matter of, am I God or is God God? Who's on the mm. throne? Is, is Jesus the Lord of my life or am I the Lord of my life? I, I'm addicted to control. I love being in Ooh. control. When I was in sixth grade, my family moved from Lambertville, Michigan, which is my childhood home, mm -hmm. where I put down roots. All my best friends were there. We had a big pine tree that we climbed in. It was a great childhood, and we moved. And I lived in a hotel for a month, and I didn't know anyone at the schools that we were trying new schools. It was just, like, uh, really hard. And ever since then, I had this need for control. Yeah. And I think that it continued all the way up until this point. And if you are living in that way, you're, first of all, you're never really in control. God is in control. We can yeah. do things um, to the best of our ability, but we're never really in control. We have a sense of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's bondage. It's a form of bondage. I was a slave to myself and the limitations that I set for myself. And so when I decided that keto w was working for me, I also subconsciously was deciding that nothing else would work and that was limiting That's to myself. The, yeah, so yes. today I'm proud to admit that I ate, I eat homemade einkorn sourdough bread. I just had some, I eat apples, I eat berries and I can still burn fat and I still am burning fat, but I'm not afraid of carbohydrates and that. That's because I'm free. The old me would not yeah. allow that. The old me would freak out if my blood sugar went into the nineties. <laughs> How much time do you spend, you know, on worrying about your ketones, autophagy, Zero. Um, right? And those Zero. types of things, right? Red light therapy, cold therapy. And I, I know you've done some cold plunges. You've been playing around with that. Yeah. Um, well, but that doesn't seem like that's a focus of things that you're like, I have to get these things in. Otherwise I can't be as optimally healthy as possible. Exactly. And that's a, that's a very, I'm glad you said that because those things ruled my life. Because mm -hmm. when I decided I'm not taking medications anymore, I also decided that I need to be biohacking. I need to do all the other things to survive. So I would do cold mm -hmm. therapy. I would do sauna and those things are good. But again, they were idols and I was telling myself, I can't function without them. And that's not true. Yeah. And it, it became true. And I was a slave yeah, to yeah. them. It ruled my life. There was no fun in it. There was no joy. There was no discovery or creativity. It was just, uh, this is what I need to do. So I was making those decisions out of fear instead of faith and enjoyment. So mm -hmm. now there is no worry. I do sauna regularly. Um, I have started cold plunging again after giving birth. I do CrossFit every morning. I lift, but I do those things because they make me feel good. Uh, exercise is my therapy. That's my, my outlet. You know, I feed the baby at five in the morning and then I get out there at five 30 and work out for an hour before my first client call. Mm -hmm. And that is my me time. I pray, I do scriptural affirmations. I sing, I worship. It's a mental, emotional outlet for me, but I'm totally fine if I skip it. 
and I'm totally yeah. fine if I miss my sauna time, and that's the difference. Yeah, the the awareness to be in touch with where you are, your body, your progress, your all of those different things. But I think for a lot of people, the impact of your choices on your quality of life. You know, we're doing this in an effort to improve our everyday life. And people tend to focus on so many things and they increase the complexity and the stress about all the things they're doing that their quality of life is going the opposite direction. Exactly. It becomes bondage. And I see yeah. that happening in every single diet culture, whatever space, even the carnivore space, even the keto space, you know, what? I mean, I, a lot of my coaching <laughs> and I'm sure you can relate is just yeah. breaking through those barriers of like, I have a client who's like, okay. This monitor says I'm burning 95% fat, but my blood sugar is 104. How can that be? I always thought blood sugars had to be in the 70s to be burning fat. Mm. It's just not as black and white simple. And I think that people read one thing or hear one thing and they just um, they just latch onto it and we become so yeah. narrow-sighted and it becomes yeah. bondage. Yeah. The, it's a conversation I do have a lot with people to say, look, you know, science is, is a great tool and when I say science, I have to be specific with the scientific community and the documents and the studies and all those types of things, the research aspect of this, of science is a great tool to allow us to understand why things are happening. Yeah. The mistake that we make is we've made science an idol yes. and now science is supposed to explain what's happening, but people are now using it to determine what they should do. Exactly. And not understanding that what works in your life is more beneficial than what any RCT meta-analysis or scientist exactly. on YouTube is going to tell you. So being willing to experiment and understand that effective results will always beat out a study any day. Exactly. And yeah. life and, is and, too uh, short to waste time on something that's not working. I mean, yes, it's, it's like we get to decide. We get to decide what works. It's your experience over the numbers. You know, yeah. at the end of my life, I don't want to say, oh, my labs looked like this. It, it's nice here if your labs look good, <laughs> but I would like to say, hey, I felt really good. I had great energy. I was productive. You know, I wasn't a slave to one way of eating or thinking. Yeah, yeah. The, one of the more, more common issues or mindset shifts that I have to, that I work with a lot of people. And it's a big part of my message is the scale and appearance, yeah. the aesthetics. How has that changed for you over time? Oh my gosh. I mean, I used to be 69 pounds and I remember looking in wow. the mirror and being so triggered by the sight of my emaciated body. However, at the same time, I would look down at my thighs and they would look fat to me at 69 wow. pounds. And anyone who's been severely underweight or overweight, I know you can understand body dysmorphia is real. There was mm -hmm. a time that I had to tape up um, paper over my full length mirror so that I just couldn't see my body because it was so triggering. And that is what, you know, started a long, long season of binge eating in a desperate attempt to gain weight and just be normal because everyone was like, you just have to gain weight to save your life because of this chronic C. diff infection, but I still had body dysmorphia and um, I really struggled, really struggled when my hormones were tanked, um, feeling comfortable in my own body. Obviously mm -hmm. I was stuck in fight flight mode. My hormones were all over the place and I just wanted to tear out of my own skin. I wasn't comfortable. I would layer my jeans with thick fleece leggings underneath to look thicker, to look acceptable. Um, but then at the same time, in my body, there were moments where I felt fat and I knew I wasn't. Right. But it's crazy how you could feel the two things at once um, with healthy hormones and also just not praising the idol of vanity. Not to say I like makeup and dresses, obviously. But yeah, it's not I mean, the we all like to look good. We want to be presentable and look good. I like to feel good and, good and present yeah, you myself want to be in a certain way. to your spouse or whatever and yeah, all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. But it's different because I used to put makeup on to cover up who I was, but now I'm mm. putting makeup on to just share who I am, you know? Wow. Um, that's awesome. And that's a big difference. I don't, I don't try to cover anything up and I am who I am. I weigh 148 pounds, but I, you know, that number used to sound really high to me. Now I'm like, I look great. I am so yeah. strong. I feel strong. 
I think I have a healthy level of body fat and there's no part of my body that I'm insecure about. That's awesome. And um, I, I function. Yeah. How important, you said two words there. Um, at the very end, you said the last one. So strong and function. How important are those two things to you now compared to what they were before? Yeah. So much more than they ever were. I would say that that's what I wanted to be. I would say, I just want to be strong and I just want to be able to function. I would say those mm -hmm. things. I would confess those things over myself all the time. But I think what I really wanted was to be accepted and to be loved. And, um, and I did strongly desire to be strong and functioning, but now they are the most important thing because I have a child and I have a husband and I have a purpose. If I'm not functioning even at a healthy emotional capacity. If I don't get up and do my affirmations, um, and my husband and I had just had an argument, which is very rare, but it happens. I need to set my mind before I start coaching, right? I need to set my mind before I can support someone else. And so those things yeah. are way more important and I make time for them. Uh, and then just being able to function is, it's a joy to, it's, I will never take it for granted to be able to wake up and do the laundry and do the dishes and make breakfast mm -hmm. and feed my baby and just be a human that gives and loves and is not self-absorbed and doesn't have to focus on these things that I used to struggle with. These autoimmune diseases were, that were just consuming. They really yeah. were, but I was also consumed by my thoughts and my, my world of suffering. The difference, particularly being a mother and getting married, because you've only been married for, was it a couple of years now? Yeah. 20, um, yeah. two years, three years. Okay. How does the function and the strength play into your ability to give and care and feel like you're fulfilling your role as yeah. a spouse and a mother? I couldn't have been married a couple of years ago. I mm -hmm. really, um, I met my husband actually right when I surrendered and like turned a corner in my health, but I spent two years healing. I just kept my head down, kept to myself. I never thought I would get married. And then we got back in touch and he was like, wow, you're like a stable human being now. <laughs> That's kind of attractive. <laughs> so I had to take that time for myself. Yeah. Um, because even though I had a desire to love someone else and to, to share life with someone, I was no, in no place to do that because I was yeah. so demanding of attention for everything I was going through. My perception of reality was not appropriate, uh, accurate. It was just like, I had to heal. So I'm glad that I took that time. I'm glad God worked out the timing in that way. So being able to just carry myself from day to day is such a blessing because you can't really love someone if it's all about you. Mm. It's about serving the other person. Yeah. So let's talk about this because this is one of the, uh, another top three or four um, struggles that I deal with, with many of my clients. Most of my clients, I think, I think I have one guy client. Most of my clients are women over 40 who have families and kids and are, yeah. have been through a lot of this stuff. But one of the biggest struggles, struggles is martyr syndrome. And you just talked about, you know, we want to take care of people. We want to, we want to give, Sorry. how do you manage or work with your clients or yourself? And say, look, as much as I want to give to the people that I love, I also have to give to myself. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you manage that thought process? You just talk them through it. You know, you listen to them because I work with a lot of the same type of people. There are a lot mm -hmm. of working, hardworking moms there who are overworked and need to take a moment because yeah. in one sentence, I hear them saying, I'm just so tired. Uh, I just don't feel good. I wish I could get off this extra weight. I keep waking up at 3 a.m. Um, I have brain fog and I just can't keep up. And, and then and then they break down and they say, I just want to be there for my kids. I want to be a good example. I want to enjoy intimacy with my husband. I want to be able to do these things, but I'm just so tired and I can't, you know, I've heard it a million times. They're just shocked when you, um, when you suggest the idea that, Hey, you should go do something for yourself. You mm -hmm. need to fill up your own cup. Okay. Well, what does it look like for you to gather yourself? What do you need to do? Or they feel yeah. guilty for spending money on more protein but they're eating 40 grams of protein per day and they can't function. It's like, you've got to choose to invest in yourself. Yeah. You have got to choose. And this is why it is a non-negotiable for me. I don't touch seed oils because when I eat seed oils, I feel like trash. I can mm -hmm. tolerate other things, but seed oils make me feel like trash. And so I don't touch them. 
And I also am, I am diligent about getting up in the morning and working out because I, like I said, it really benefits me emotionally and mentally. And that is my me time. And sometimes it just looks like quiet time going for a walk or something, but I have to mm -hmm. fill up my own cup. I have to allow the Lord to fill up my cup so that I can pour into others. But if I am empty and I'm not investing in myself and I'm not giving myself the time or attention that I give to others, how can I expect it to come out of me? Um, right. yeah. I, yeah. I like to tell my clients the way that you treat yourself and the expectation that you have of yourself. I want it to be the, the same way you would talk to your daughter or your son. Would you tell your daughter, oh, just figure it out, you know, just just muster up the energy, but starve yourself and don't make any time for yourself and don't go to mm -hmm. sleep at a normal, a good time. We have to invest in ourselves. I think that everyone yeah. has way too high of expectations and is not really willing to put in the work, which is actually just investing in yourself. It feels mm -hmm. like work, um, but it's really self-care. It's tough love. Yeah. yeah. I like that. You know, what would you advise your kids? Like for, yeah. for any parent when you're, you know, what would you do if you were, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and you saw what your children were doing with their family and they were overextending themselves and right. overworking, what advice would you give them and why aren't you doing that? Exactly. That's a really good, that's a really good picture. One of the things that you, you mentioned triggered a, a thought and I'm wondering in the process of your journey, did you have things that you were doing that you wanted to do, you said was your motivation or your goal? that was because of outside expectations versus what you actually wanted in your life? Yeah, when I struggled with the binge eating, I just had so much pressure, even from strangers. They would just be like, you just need to eat a bunch of cheeseburgers and, <laughs> and gain weight, get your life yeah. together, girl. Like, it's not that simple, but also my family. I was held against my own will in an eating disorder unit. Everyone thought I had an eating disorder and that uh, pressure and misdiagnosis really messed with me to the point where I was like, maybe I do have an eating disorder. Maybe it's all just mm -hmm. an eating disorder. And so I would just start eating foods that were hurting me and it was horrendous. And that yeah. is what happens when you crush under the pressure of other people, other people's expectation. That's not what it was about. It was actually about C. diff and, and healing my gut. And I had to be a little bit more uh, precise with healing that. Mm -hmm. But I just... I fell under the pressure of wanting to please people around me. I would definitely say I've been a people pleaser for most of my life, but I'm definitely not anymore, which feels really good. <laughs> you learned how to say no, right? You learned exactly. how to say no. I'm the priority here. What I want and what the people exactly. that, are, that, that I care about need are more important than what anybody else thinks. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's that the power in that, I don't even know. I think it's something everyone struggles with. It's something I struggle with. I, you know, I am very clear to myself what my message is, but I even find myself sometimes thinking you know, as an influencer, as someone who's putting content out, it's like, do I want to say that? How are people going to receive that? Oh and yeah. I have to remind myself, like, it doesn't matter how it people doesn't matter. It. This, this is, is the, the this truth. is my truth. Right. I need to say it, you know? And, and yeah, so we all go through that. I think a little bit when you, you mentioned your gut health, what are some of the things, what was the process you went through? Because I want to highlight because i don't know the details right we we haven't yeah. gone into detail prior to all your history and everything but i would expect one of my favorite one of my my most you know the common thing that i say is that we all have a different journey but we all have a lot of the same checkpoints along the way and i would guess that there was a lot of trial and error in your process of figuring out what what you needed to do to get rid of the C. diff, to improve your gut health, to fix the health issues and those types of things. Could you talk a little bit about that process of experimentation, failing, yeah. learning, trying again, how long it took? What are some of the things you had to change in your mindset about what this process is, all those types of things? Yeah. I mean, even before I was diagnosed with C. diff, I knew it was in the gut. I thought it was parasites for a long time. I mm -hmm. uh, did the, the diatomaceous earth. I did binders. I did you know, oregano oil. I even did ozone therapy in New York City. I did so many different things and nothing was helping. Mm -hmm. So when I was finally diagnosed with C. diff, I tried the antibiotics. They didn't work. And um, I just kept getting worse and worse and kept losing more and more weight. And so I said, I want to do a fecal transplant. And they said, you have to try every single antibiotic three times before you can be approved for a fecal transplant, according to insurance. Wow. And wow. so there were like five different antibiotics that I could potentially take, and I had to take them three times. 
So I did 13 rounds and I finally said, I'm not doing anymore. You've got to give me this. I'm literally killing myself with antibiotic. And they approved me and I did three total fecal transplants and it kept coming back. The C. diff mm. was seeded in my gut. So fecal transplants are great. I think they work for a lot of people. They've worked with clients I've worked with, but in the end it was proper nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. And just removing oxalate was the huge thing because that was ketogenic for almost 15 years prior to a carnivore diet, which mm -hmm. we're not really getting into, but it was about the anti-nutrient oxalate, I believe, because I was definitely fat adapted, running primarily on fat, but still filling up on anti-nutrients, baby spinach, turmeric, you know, bulk turmeric, because I, I thought it would help me, of course, yeah. black pepper, cumin on everything. It's crazy the amount of oxalate I was consuming. So I believe that was binding to a lot of nutrients, preventing absorption and damaging my gut. And then mm -hmm. when I removed all of that, I was able to start absorbing nutrients again and, and gain weight for the first time in years. So that was the start of it was just removing the interference and providing the proper foundation. But a large part of it also was getting into a good environment. So um, I was no longer in contact with my family for a large portion of my healing journey. They thought I had an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I checked myself out against medical advice from the eating disorder unit. And I was like, this isn't the problem. <laughs> I'm getting worse. But everyone thought I had an eating disorder. So I moved to Illinois by myself. Wow. Um, not in contact with my family. Literally, my mother had me blocked. I couldn't even call her. And actually, that was really traumatizing and really difficult. But it was also kind of a blessing to be in an environment where people weren't assuming that I had an eating disorder, where people didn't know that I'm Rebecca Farmer, who my engagement broke off and I'm no longer in real estate and I moved back in with my parents and I basically went crazy getting off of clonazepam. I'm just this right. skinny girl who goes to the gym and goes to the chiropractor <laughs> and eats meat. And that was a blessing. It really helped me to just stay consistent, keep my head down. So that is also a large part of healing the gut, is removing stress from your life. If you are constantly exposed to arguments and stressful, toxic relationships and situations and environments, that wears down your gut. And I think that people don't realize that our behaviors and relationships and environment are equally as impactful as nutrition. Yeah. I'm actually reading a book right now called um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Ooh. It's a fascinating book. I suggest everybody look at it, take a look. And it's basically a book about stress. And the whole concept of the book is just, it's the bio, it's kind of getting into the biology and physiology of stress response. Yeah. And, that sounds great. you know, he, he talks about, you know, in the wild, the stress response is like you, you mentioned earlier, fight or flight. You know, I'm a zebra. I have a lion who's trying to chase me down and eat me. I got, or he caught me and I've got guts spilling out everywhere, whatever it may be. And my body is responding to this immense trauma that's happening, but it's acute. And how human beings are different because our bodies respond in the exactly the same way. Yeah. But it can be triggered just by what we think. Yes. Oh my right? goodness. Right. It can be triggered just by our thoughts. Our body can respond exactly the same way as a zebra's body responds when it's being chased by a lion, but just by the things that we think. Yeah. And he said to do a he said do a really um if I can remember this this uh this exercise, it was something i gotta i gotta look this up he said there is an exercise you can do if you're not sure about how this works right he said when you go to bed at night lay down and have a thought about something you you messed up or think about something negative that happened throughout the day and watch how your body just responds automatically yeah. you're not going to fall asleep as fast you're going to sleep you're going to wake up and then like all these different responses to just the things that happen biologically in our body based on what we're thinking so when we are constantly exposed to negative thoughts, stressful right. situations, or when we, because of our belief system or the limiting beliefs that we have or our perception of something, even if it may not be reality, our bodies are gonna respond to that and that yep. impacts the gut, that impacts, impacts our immune system, that impacts our, you know, our, our brain biology, all these different brain chemistry. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's a huge piece. Yeah, I mean, we could just have a whole nother podcast just on that. It's all yeah. about the story we tell ourselves, the inner dialogue, where the mind goes, the man follows. I had to change the way that I think and change the way I speak. And that changes the trajectory of your life. 
It's so, yeah. so true. Working with people, if I hear someone say, I'm just not absorbing nutrients or it's, you know, it's my, um, you know, my kidney disease. It's like, first of all, don't claim that it's not your kidney disease. It's the disease that you're fighting and, and it's not who you are. And don't say you're not absorbing nutrients because it becomes true. And I know that sounds really woo woo, but it's what you just said. The more mm -hmm. that you proclaim things over yourself, the more it becomes true. We have so the, I mean, life and death are in the tongue, how we speak. It is so powerful. And I, I wish more people would take accountability for their thoughts yes. and their words because well, we could change yeah. the world. And the understanding of two things, words have meaning. So when we're not using words in the way they're intended to be used, mm -hmm. it matters. It yeah, matters. Absolutely. And then secondly, we don't say things. If we can get to that one step of understanding the words that we're actually saying when we say them, I think that will help the second piece, which is we're not going to say something if we don't truly believe it. Exactly. You know, you can't say something. It's like when you're a kid all the time and say, you know, you say something snarky to somebody. Yeah. And, oh, I was just kidding. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. If you said it, there's something in your brain. There's something in yes. your thought processes that that is coming yeah. from. It's not coming out of nowhere. So I think those two things are huge. How do you build awareness? How do you help your clients build awareness of the words that they're saying and the, the thought processes and things that are um, going on in their head? I mean, slowing down and taking time throughout the day to pause. I think that the body scan is a great way to start with awareness. You mm -hmm. just sit and you focus on, okay, what areas of my body are, am I tensing right now? Because that's something I used to catch in myself all the time. I would constantly be clenching, holding my breath all the time, um, just tight. And so I think a body scan is a great way for anyone to just create the awareness that like, you are constantly doing things that you're not aware you're doing. Yeah. And then and then bring in things like affirmations and um, you know, being more intentional about the words that you're using, being more intentional about listening before you speak. I, I think awareness is also intention. It's being mm. more intentional and you have to create awareness to do that. Otherwise you're just floating and guessing and and being the victim. Oh, you just said the most powerful word. Yeah. The victim. You know, I don't know if you saw my clip recently, but that the victim every time i hear the word victim the first thing that pops in my head is claiming a diagnosis or claiming a condition and uh this whole concept of falling off the wagon yeah um, oh you know, i did see that we're, it was so we're good. driving right we're driving so how, yeah if you're the one driving you see everything you know you, you see the can't pothole, fall you off see the wagon. this you can't fall off the wagon yeah um and that that's giving up ownership that's giving up control and accountability your journey, your, and accountability in a way right? accountability you're, it's a, it's yeah, almost like an excuse a hundred percent yeah, hundred percent. But people don't look at it that way. So, and again, that's that's a great example of the what you're saying. Think about what you're saying to yourself. Yeah. What does it really mean, and why are you saying it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a reason we're saying these things, and there's powerful things we say about ourselves. And I, mm -hmm. I'm guilty of it still to this day. If I'm in a bad mood, I'll say things that's like, I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> and I will repent yeah. <laughs> and I will rebuke it. Um, but it. You know, like we're all human. We all live in our flesh, but we really need to use our words wisely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I feel like we could go on and on and on. We should Me probably too. schedule another one sometime or, or do something. But what are some things that you can leave with people to help them? We'll just, we'll be specific to understand how do they, how do people deal? How can you help people deal with the developing the patience? To work through the process well let's let's, let's be specific there because it, it doesn't happen overnight so how do you how do you help people deal with that i mean if the person i'm working with is a believer then we're definitely going to talk about the fact that there is grace mm -hmm. if you receive god's grace that means uh grace literally is the ability to do all things through christ and so if you receive grace from god then you will have the ability to give grace to yourself and have grace with yourself and if you can do mm -hmm. that that means you don't have to be a perfectionist. And that means you have the patience to take baby steps instead of expecting instant gratification and changes overnight. That takes patience and courage and strength. So giving grace to yourself is a big one. And that doesn't mean making excuses, but it means actually having the courage to do your best even if, you, if things aren't going the way you expected them to. Right. I think that healing and progress 
always looks different than what we expect. So many people I work with are like, I want to lose 90 pounds in two months. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know if I can help you do that, but we can we can get a good head start. And so yeah. you have to give yourself grace and you have to be willing to, um, you know, allow things to happen naturally. You have to also be grateful and enjoy the process um, yeah. because life is going to pass you by if you can't learn how to do that. There will always be something else that you want. There will always be something better, you know, in your mind's eye. So you have to learn how to appreciate where you're at right now and and work it to the best of your ability. Um, you have to find joy now and also um, lean into adversity. It's it's a teacher. Mm. It's a good thing. I think so many people, when they run into adversity, they're like, there's no hope. <laughs> it's like, this is just life. And yeah. you have to realize this is a teacher and this is a stepping stone for you to grow. This is going to build your character and this is going to create you. This is going to help you to become who you were created to be. Because if life were just perfect and simple and easy, then we wouldn't have any character. Oh, I love it. I, there's a quote, there's a, a line in my book that's coming out um, that says, your road can't be a straight path because if it were, you wouldn't be ready when you got there. And that's so good. And that's, and that's literally, that's what we're talking about, right? Exactly. You know, it, it, I like to compare it to, you know, lottery winners. I think it's like 80% of people that, and I'm pulling this out of my butt. I'm just looking at, thinking about something I read a long time ago. <laughs> a high percentage of people that win the lottery or end up, end up bankrupt or broke within oh, yeah. like two, two years because they are not mentally prepared to handle that much money. Exactly. You know, oh, it's yeah. just, they're oh, not ready for it. The character so and everything, I mean, you know? Yes. Yeah, everything that I went through and everything you've gone through has literally been a teacher for what we do for other people now. People are like, yes. where did you get certified? And it's like Health Coach Institute, but I didn't really learn anything. Yeah, I right. everything I know and apply to my clients through fighting for my life for 13 years. And I'm sure the same applies to you. Very like much. I got a certification because people want to see it. But that's not where I learned much at all. Yeah. And I'm yeah. grateful for what I, I don't think I would ask for it. And I don't know if I could do it again, but I don't regret it mm -hmm. because it has made me who I am. A hundred percent. Man, this has been fantastic. Where can people find you, Rebecca? They've so I'm on Instagram you. and on my website is tailoredketo.health or tailoredketohealth. I'm on YouTube, uh, Rebecca Heishman, Tailored Keto Health. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it. We're definitely going to have to do this again. Seriously. Thank you awesome. so much.